Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. And tonight, we're going to talk about something that you may have heard and you may have wanted to learn more about. And that's where we came from. So there's been a lot of conversation around quantum computing, especially as it relates to things we care about as information security professionals, things like cryptography and breaking cryptography potentially. And I don't know about our listeners or you, Andy, but when I hear about something that kind of sounds like a boogeyman or like the sky is falling or like it's too good to be true or any combination thereof, my inclination is let's go learn about it and let's find out what the real answers are. And Andy, it sounds like that was really a driver for you that this had kind of come up in, in some work conversations, quantum computing and quantum cryptography. And you decided to learn more and kind of went down a rabbit hole and thought, you know, I think this is something our listeners would be interested in. And I agree. I'm interested in it, and I think our listeners will be as well. So tell us more. What are we talking about with quantum computers tonight? Yeah, so when I went down this rabbit hole, and this was the most research I've done for an episode since we started the podcast, I split it up into two different episodes. So we'll start with how quantum computers work in this first episode, and then we'll do another episode on quantum cryptography. And you don't necessarily need to know how quantum computers work to understand that they are a threat to cybersecurity in general and the ability to break encryption as it's widely used today. But as technologists, I just think it's super interesting. And just knowing a little bit about something can go a long ways later on. And that's really for anything in cybersecurity. So first, we're going to talk about quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics is basically the physics of studying things that are extremely small, like subatomic particles. For example, like photons, electrons, the nuclei of an atom. And we're all familiar with how physics works in our everyday lives as we interact with matter around us. But when things get to a subatomic level, they have different rules that they play by. So there's these quantum phenomenons that happen that are proven to happen over and over again. Scientists can't really explain why they happen. They just know that it happens. And so it's just called a phenomenon and they know it happens. It's important because these phenomenons impact how quantum computers work and how we build them and how we understand them. So take like quantum tunneling, for example. If you take a bicycle going up a hill in classical mechanics, as long as you have enough energy, you'll get to the top. However, in quantum mechanics, the bicycle will move through the hill to the other side, even if it has less energy than required. So it's these weird things that just kind of happen. Scientists observe that they happen in a repeated experiments, repeated states, and they just know that it happens. So these phenomenon are important as we kind of discuss how quantum computers are made. The majority of quantum computers, the components that make up a quantum computer are very similar to your classical computers, like um, power supply, storage, RAM. RAM is a little bit different. There's like quantum RAM, um, but the idea is still the same where it's volatile and that it's faster than storage. And so it allows it to interact closer to the CPU. And there's a motherboard, there's a CPU, there's cooling. The main difference is how the CPU works. In traditional computing, information's encoded in the form of bits, zeros and ones. And data is stored and transferred and executed by changing those bits. In quantum computers, 
the equivalent is called a quantum bit or a qubit. And qubits are subatomic matter, electrons, protons, ions, nucleus of an atom. It really doesn't matter as long as it's a quantum object that can be contained, manipulated, and measured. And it requires a lot of cooling because unlike traditional silicon bits, qubits are really easily interfered with with any level of heat, just like any subatomic particles in the environment around the computer. And so qubits are kept at near zero Kelvin. And for example, in IBM's quantum computers, they're kept around 15 millikelvin. And that's at the temperature that basically the particles are not energized or have very little movement, approximately negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit. It's also known as absolute zero. And it's colder than outer space. And the qubits sit at the bottom on a chip in this thing called a dilution refrigerator, which basically looks like the largest heat sink that you can possibly imagine. So how do these qubits generate computing power? Well, qubits, like for example, in our case, we'll take like an electron. They're suspended in a magnetic field. And when the electron is suspended, it'll spin on its axis and create a small magnetic field like the Earth's magnetic field when, when it spins. And just like the Earth's magnetic, magnetic, magnetic field, it'll flow from one direction to another like a pole, right? From like the South Pole to the North Pole. And when you suspend an electron's magnetic field inside of another magnetic field, it'll naturally align its poles with the outside magnetic field's direction. Like a compass aligning with the Earth's magnetic field. And since this is the natural state of the electron or qubit that requires the least amount of energy, we can basically consider this a zero in like traditional bits. Or in the quantum state, it's called spin down. And then similar to like if you were to move your finger on the compass and point it, say, south, the qubits can be charged with energy to, to point in the opposite direction, like a traditional bit, like one, in this case, we'll call it spin up. So you have your spin up, spin down positions, or your traditional zeros and ones. And we're going to add a phenomenon that's unique to quantum mechanics, specifically important to quantum computers called superposition. And superposition is one of those things, like I said, it just happens and scientists observe that it happens and the qubits spin in every direction possible within a sphere. And it's mathematically represented with a fraction between one and zero, indicating the probability of it being spin up or spin down. It's only when we choose to read its state that it chooses up or down. So the best way that I can explain how this essentially works is like, imagine spinning a quarter on a desk. It's not heads or tails. It's actually both at the same time. It's only when you stop the coin and you read it that it's heads or tails. And so that's like the state of this electron that it's just spinning and it can be in any state up or down. And it's only when you stop to read it that it's actually up or down. So that's how superposition works. And that's the phenomenon that also gives it its power because in traditional computing or classical computing, you only have two states, zero or one. But in quantum computing, because of superposition, you get this two to the N number of states or computing power that quantum computers can have where N is the number of qubits. And so if you have three qubits, you actually have eight states or eight qubits of power that can process your problem that you're trying to input into it. I'll take a pause there because that was a lot of information. I tried to explain it as best as I could. Any thoughts on that so far, Adam? Anybody that's familiar with like Schrodinger's cat, that's kind of a, a similar concept here when you're talking about um, reading the state and and how 
you know, it can be both until you read it and then it's one or the other, but until you, until you read it, you know, with superposition, it could be both essentially. I mean, I'm, this stuff is really complex and it's hard to even uh, kind of deal with all the new language and everything. I, I thought that was super interesting talking about IBM's quantum computer and how it operates at practically absolute zero. You know, it's a couple of milli Kelvin above absolute zero. Um, that's, that's just incredible that that's, you know, the current state it has to be in. And it kind of speaks to the fact of, of how early days we are. Um, and I'm sure maybe you were going to make this observation a little bit later on, Andy, but I think back to almost the early days of computing with the vacuum tubes and ENIAC and, uh, at my alma mater, by the way, Iowa state university, the NASA Barry computer, the first digital computer created, um, in Ames, Iowa, it, they were so rudimentary compared to today. And it feels like we're still in those very early days with quantum as well. Um, we know it will change things long term, but when you have to have it, it uh, at, at practically the, the lowest possible temperature that, that is, that can exist um, given our current understanding of physics and everything like that's, you know, that's pretty mind boggling that that's how far extreme we have to get to, to make functional quantum computers today. Um, and so that's super interesting. And then another point too, and I'm sure we'll touch on this a little more as we go along, but you know, all the big tech companies are, are doing a lot of research on this right now. Um, and, and they kind of keep leapfrogging each other. And again, our employer definitely is doing a lot with quantum computing as well, but Google, um, has major quantum computing research. And I believe maybe at the minute they have, you know, the most qubits or whatever is the, you know, the measurement of choice, the metric of choice to brag about. Um, I know IBM has done some really amazing work and as a former IBMer, you know, one thing about IBM is they, they have routinely been and continue to be the uh, American company that files and receives the most patents every year. Um, research is really a, a long history and tradition uh, at IBM. And then I could snarkily say it, it doesn't necessarily translate into revenues, um, <laughs> but they certainly do uh, uh, a lot of research and, and have done a lot, particularly with quantum. So this is all super interesting. If you're having trouble following along, um, that's okay. Maybe give this a re-listen once you have the context and it'll maybe the, the pieces will fit together. I have heard a lot of this before because I kind of looked this up before. Um, and so it's easier to follow along with Andy cause I kind of know some of this and I'm just slotting in new bits of info. So again, if, if, if this just is a lot, certainly maybe re-listen to this pod or go find some other material. I'm sure there's material on YouTube or, or Wikipedia that can help explain this as well, because I think it's valuable to understand. And as this becomes more mainstream, we're going to hear more about it. So um, it's, it's valuable for all of us as technologists to at least kind of have a pulse on where this sits and where it's going. Yeah. I probably watched 15 plus videos on both quantum cryptography and quantum computers to try to put together these two episodes. So it is a lot to take in. So I'm trying to make it condense and as easily explained as possible for the listeners here. So another quantum phenomenon that's important to understand is quantum entanglement. And the concept of that is basically two quantum particles become entangled at that temperature and we have to keep them entangled. If they are, they'll always display the opposite of the other one. So in case of say qubits, if they are entangled, if one is spin up, the other one is spin down. And that is always true as long as the qubits are entangled. So just one of those things that happens and it's important to understand because we have to keep qubits entangled for quantum computers to work. When a quantum computer is running, and I explained this previously, like when it's actually in the superposition, you can't actually read the state. And so superposition is a state that we can use, but as soon as we read the results, we have a classical answer, like a zero or a one. So the important thing is, how do you know when to stop and read the result? And how do you know if the result is correct, a zero or a one? If I input an answer, if I input a problem into a computer and it does all this stuff, how do I know when to stop and read it? And that's kind of the, 
the crux of the problem with quantum computers. And so the, the answer to that is there are special quantum algorithms, which you actually use the probability of superpositions to do your calculations. The algorithms use math to ensure the probability of getting the right answer is as high as it can be. When it's done, you come up with a usable state that, that can be read. So this simply means you use the algorithm to solve the problem. The usable state at the end is your solution or answer. So it's important that the input to a quantum computer or the problem you're trying to solve is a classical problem. And then the measured answer at the end is also classical. But when the calculations are running, aka when the superposition is happening, there's no logs, there's no record. It's doing everything at the same time. I, I, I try to think of this as, there's so many different examples, but like say, like a maze, right? A maze has one answer to get through. And a traditional computer may calculate one route and it's wrong and then it'll go back and calculate another route and then it'll calculate another route until it gets the right route. Whereas a quantum computer calculates all the routes at the same time. And so that's essentially why quantum computers are a threat to cryptography in general, because it can solve problems that have an enormous amount of variables in a short period of time. They're not always faster than classical computers, and in some cases, they can actually be slower. But for us as cybersecurity professionals, quantum computers are a threat because the primary encryption algorithm that we use is public key cryptography, which relies on the factorization of primes, a large prime number, and then getting its factors. And that is something that quantum computers can do very, very well. Another thing to note, Adam, you kind of alluded to this in, you know, whatever the flavor of the day is, the number of qubits. And I've read in the news, you know, so-and-so has 10,000 qubits, 1 million qubits. I mean, I've seen some crazy numbers, but these special quantum algorithms require fault tolerance. And that's really important to remember. The algorithms that we know of today to solve some of these problems require millions of error-corrected qubits. In some cases, a few thousand, tens of thousands, but in some of them, millions of error-corrected or fault-tolerant qubits. Today, we're at roughly 50 to 127 fault-tolerant quantum chips with IBM, I think, looking to debut a thousand plus qubit processor in 2023. But those are fault tolerant, error corrected qubits. And so the common misconception that you often see is like, oh, how many qubits do you have? Like you think of it like in traditional computing power, right? Like what's the gigahertz of your processor or whatever. Um, but because the qubits are so sensitive to noise, environmental effects, that there are some errors that are just out of your control. And any one of these effects can collapse the superposition of the qubit. So if you're adding more qubits to your quantum chip and they're not error corrected, you're just compounding and multiplying the problems that you have. So it's really not about how many qubits that you have or even stable qubits. It's really about error corrected or fault tolerant qubits. And those are the ones that matter in these quantum algorithms. So I can think of a good comparison for that now that you've explained that, Andy. And I think back to the megapixel arms race on mobile phones many years ago, which is kind of mostly settled down today. You hear a lot less about it. But especially in kind of, I, I would say, the puberty years of the iPhone, as an example, um, oftentimes Apple got crushed because they were still doing 5 megapixel and 8 megapixel sensors while the Android phones were doing, you know, some goofy amount of teens and double digit megapixels. And there of course was some, uh, 
<laughs> trash talked back and forth. And the more you dug into it, the more you would understand that on a sensor that small with glass that small, um, adding more megapixels didn't necessarily lead to better photos because the more megapixels you have on a small sensor, the less light each, each, um, component of the image sensor could gather. And so it actually led to worse low light performance. Um, it led to noisier pictures that had more kind of noise, random noise in them, that more grainy effect. Um, and so outside of perfect lighting conditions, they actually weren't better at anything. Um, but they sure made an awesome, you know, bullet point on a chart to compare against. And in reality, you were much better off having larger, fewer pixels that could gather more light and deliver better low light performance. That is actually what people want to do because they go out to bars. They, you know, people do stuff past when the sun goes down. There's all sorts of scenarios. Indoor lighting is just poor where you need good low light performance. And, um, it turns out that was way more important. So I kind of make that comparison here where just saying, Hey, we've got, you know, so many thousand qubits might not be as important as having error corrected or fault tolerant qubits that can reliably perform a function. Um, and so I think that's, that's kind of, it sounds like at least a reasonable analogy to make. Yeah, that's a great analogy. So a lot of this is theory and a lot of this is in practice today. Surprisingly, quantum computers have actually been around longer than I realized. The first theory of a quantum computer was way back in like 1959. And the first workable quantum computer was in 1998. And so I didn't realize even back then that we had quantum computers. But, you know, since then there have been quite a few advances. Even today we have quantum computers in the cloud, you know, because of this cooling component, like, I don't think you're ever going to have, you know, like a personal quantum computer in your house, at least not for the foreseeable future, certainly not going to have like a phone that's using a quantum chip, but quantum computers as a cloud service is available today. There are some free quantum computers for use over the cloud at like some universities, um, companies that are doing research like IBM. There are some, ones that are paid like we at Microsoft host quantum computers as a service in Azure. So it's, it's very early in the stage still to be talking about, you know, the breaking of encryption. That's not there yet, but you can use quantum computers on a small level with, you know, a few qubits, right? Like 20 to 50 qubits and use that still to, to calculate problems today. So it's, it is a reality, but some of the things that we're trying to do with it is not there yet. And there's also a lot of things that need to happen. Like for example, we don't really have a language to kind of do things to make calls on quantum computers because the languages that we're using today, like Java, C++, I mean, those are all used to provide a layer of abstraction to assembly and machine language to converse with classical computers and we don't really have that yet and so that needs to be kind of invented so there's going to be an evolution of software along with hardware before really quantum computers become a little bit more mainstream i saw something and and this was just interesting as i was looking at the azure quantum web page here you know it said flexibility to use your preferred development tools with support for circ kiskit and Q sharp. Don't know what any of those are, but I'm intrigued. Oh. Uh, but, 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 but certainly if you know look either. at, if you look at classical computing, obviously if you really compare the introduction of the microcomputer, as it used to be called the personal computer in the 1970s with the introduction really of the Apple II in 1977. Um, and, and you kind of bring that forward to today, we're looking at just a hair over, um, you know, 45, 46 years of, of personal computing and how far that's evolved today and the evolution of programming languages that has come with that. Um, again, these are just things we're not going to have overnight or, or very quickly with quantum as well. 
as far as I, I think that was a really good comparison, like machine language assembly, you know, that's how people used to write applications for PCs at first, because they didn't have enough computing power to run a abstracted language that abstracted a lot of that stuff away from you. Like today in modern programming languages, there are things you don't have to worry about as much as far as uh, protected memory, garbage collection, et cetera, et cetera. Versus back in the day, you had to do it all yourself if you were writing in machine language or assembly. And I, I would imagine even with some of those kind of development environments that the Azure quantum page refers to, I bet again, there's still very early days in terms of, abstracting away a lot of it from the developer where you still have to have a pretty intimate knowledge of the environment you're running on and the circumstances of it and all of that. Just like they did back then when uh, developers in the 1970s and early 1980s, like they really understood what they were writing code on um, and all of the intricacies of it and all the ways to get every last bit of performance out of it. It kind of feels like that all over again, that almost gold rush, if you will, from the early days of, of personal computing um, with this. So that's exciting. And I think that's really interesting to follow, um, especially as in technology, you know, so much of today is iteration on technologies that have been established for the long time. I honestly think the last big paradigm shift in computing for many of us that have been around for a little while now was the smartphone. You know, the introduction of the iPhone, in January, 2007, I mean, that felt like another world, you know, it was, it was mind boggling. You go back and watch the introduction of the original iPhone and people lose their minds over scrolling. Like Steve Jobs scrolls through a list of like contacts and people are like falling out of their chairs at the Moscone center over it because it was that big of a quantum leap. And so obviously very different circumstances here. It's not going to be something we carry in our pockets. It's not going to impact the daily lives of everyone in, in a very visceral way, but in long term, you know, there are so many challenges, so many problems that can be solved by this. And it's going to be fun to watch the development of it and follow it as technologists. We're always looking for that next frontier and, and here it is kind of right in front of us. And so that's our show for this week. Next week, we're going to talk about quantum cryptography and build on this episode and hopefully kind of tie it back to a little bit more of what we need to know as information security professionals going forward. But I thought this was a super fun episode to research and learn about. Hopefully our listeners here learn something. And if not, you're an expert on physics and quantum mechanics Maybe you can teach us something. So thanks for listening and watching as always. If you have any questions or topics you want us to talk about, our contact information will be in the show notes as well as some of the notes on tonight's episode. Thanks. So we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.